Today we're going to be reviewing the Jeep Wagoneer. Now the Wagoneer is Jeep's largest SUV. It's based on the Ram 1500 pickup truck with a body on frame construction. And today we're going to be taking a look under the hood and underneath this vehicle to see what's inside and how it works. And we're going to start under the hood where we have Jeep's antiquated 5.7 liter V8 engine situated longitudinally for a rear wheel drive layout. Now this engine is going to be replaced by an inline 6.3 liter so we're not going to really judge it too much for what it is. And this engine is made into an 8 speed automatic transmission down underneath the vehicle with a proper transfer case for a four wheel drive setup. Taking a look at how things work under the hood here, you can see we've got the air intake system where air is gonna be drawn in right here through the air filter and then sent directly to the throttle body. This engine is naturally aspirated. Now changing the air filter is pretty straightforward. There's just four bolts, pops right off and then you have access to the air filter. And with the air intake out of the way, you can see it frees up a lot more space around here. We have the dryer by wire throttle body that's gonna feed air directly into this plastic intake manifold, which is gonna distribute it to the eight cylinders. Now taking a look at the passenger bank here, you can see the changing spark plugs are pretty easy. You just have these ignition coils that you pop off and you get easy access to the spark plugs. Now those are actually sitting on top of a plastic valve cover over here, which then sits on this aluminum head. Further down in between here, you can see this rusty thing is actually an iron block. That's right jeep is still using an iron block with their 5.7 hemis now similarly over here on the driver's side the spark plugs are pretty easy to access i really like this old school design you don't have to take off any intake manifolds or any other brackets or anything in the way it's pretty easy to work on now in terms of the oil changes this vehicle does use 0w 20 weight oil and the oil dipstick is pretty easy to access right here now, while we're on the topic of maintenance let's take a look at the dry belt setup you can see down there we have the crankshaft then we've got this big belt here that runs to this giant motor generator this is part of jeep's e torque system which is a mild hybrid system first functioning like a generator which is going to charge a 48 volt battery down underneath the center console inside the vehicle and then that's going to charge the 12 volt battery over here now as a motor this can also apply torque through this belt down to the crankshaft at the bottom there so that you get much faster start stops when you're idling instead of powering all eight cylinders and wasting gas i find it strange that they're using a grooved belt rather than a tooth belt in order to transfer torque down to that crankshaft but you can see they're using two idlers one hydraulic over here and then just one regular idle over here so that they can power that now just below that working off the same belt we do have the ac compressor at the bottom now moving over to the cooling system as a secondary belt here we have this water pump now this is just a stretch belt there's no tensioners on it now if you follow that water pump pulley around the water pump is actually this giant piece of aluminum here that's attached to the front of the engine it actually gets replaced as an entire assembly with the thermostat hidden inside of here now speaking of coolant here we have a giant plastic radiator fan right up at the front here and then in front of it we have the radiator cap and of course the radiator would sit over here now what i do like is that this vehicle is large enough so you don't have to remove the entire front fascia in order to change out the fan or the radiator it just kind of slides out this way now looking down at the front here looks like we might have active grill shutters to help with warming up as well as fuel economy on the highway now in behind the drive belt we do have a timing chain now there's not much to see here but there's a single camshaft located within the block itself there's no overhead cams because this uses a push rod design however there are things like variable valve timing as well as cylinder deactivation and their solenoids are all located underneath this intake manifold now at the top of the engine here you can see we've got this fuel rail this is port ejected only which is good because you don't have to worry about carbon building up the back of the valves now this is a pretty old school engine which means that there is no direct injection for a better economy now next up on the driver's side we've got the braking system here you can see the reservoir and the computer off to the left here inside of here is the abs motor you'll notice that there's no vacuum powered brake booster or any traditional style master cylinder that's because everything is done through this module over here that's why the brakes are very non-linear and sometimes really touchy but it also means you're going to have to get a computer in order to activate this to pressure bleed it you can't do it the old school way now looking at the some of the components here we've got the engine computer located next to the 12 volt battery pretty easy to access and work on because there's just so much room in this engine bay whereas the grand Cherokee had it underneath the passenger seat so here's the fuse box on the driver's side and one thing I don't like is that a lot of manufacturers are integrating relays into this fuse box to make the entire thing replaceable as opposed to having those relays that you can actually just change by itself that makes it a lot more expensive now looking at the back of the headlight unfortunately there's no bulbs or anything to replace because the entire thing is LED so you will actually have to replace the entire headlight assembly which is gonna be pretty expensive in a thousand hours or so or whenever these LEDs burn out here's another thing I don't like radar sensors which are right at the 
the same height as your kid when he comes out of karate class and these are going to be pretty expensive to replace not to mention calibrate look at the ground strap on this between the body and the engine looks like it's made of paper first thing i do is upgrade that this bracket here is made for every other engine except this 5.7 liter engine and once you remove that bracket all you have is this thin little fender liner here and the wheel underneath that's because none of this stuff here is structural it's a body on frame vehicle which means that the frame runs over here and this is just a hang on panel now, overall under the hood things are pretty well laid out and easy to get to with a lot of room to work on let's go down underneath the vehicle to take a look at what's going on taking a look under the wagon here you can see that there's no body panels or skid plates or anything covering up underneath it's just all laid out very easy to access but also not really protected from the elements now we're going to start at the front here and make our way towards the back this here is the tubular structure that runs along the length of the vehicle and it begins at the front here where it bolts against this radiator cradle which is backed with steel which i like as opposed to having plastic in there now just underneath the front bumper here we have this plastic spoiler and it's controlled by this electronic motor and what it does at higher speeds is it's going to deploy which is going to prevent air from coming underneath the vehicle to give you better aerodynamics at highway speed but definitely need that when you're rushing the kids down to school on a monday morning down underneath here is the cooling fan assembly this entire thing is just one giant piece of plastic and there's the radiator petcock valve now from the bottom here is a clear view of the dry belt setup. You got the crank moving the AC compressor and then that e-torque setup up at the top there. Now the AC compressor is going to be pretty easy to replace. This being a truck you got a lot of room around here to work on and get it out especially when it burns out from cooling off that giant fish tank in the back. Now because this is a ladder frame design this is the first cross member over here. You got these nice perforated holes in here so that the bees can make their nest here when this vehicle does hit the junkyard. Now just behind that front cross member is the steering rack which is mounted to it and you can see it's got an electronic power steering motor as opposed to a hydroelectric one like the Jeep Wrangler and that's one of the first clues that you really bought this Jeep more for the brand and image as opposed to taking it off-road. Now next up we have the front differential here we have the drain and the fill ports over here it's going to take its power from the prop shaft of the transfer case and send it out to these CV axles and then to the wheels. Now while this does have a front differential locker which I'm pretty surprised it's still not going to be the solid axle design like what's on the Wrangler or the Ram 2500s. Next up we're going to take a look at the suspension here you can see we just have one bushing at the front and one at the rear here with this giant c-shaped arm the strut hooked up at the middle there and a single ball joint out at the aluminum knuckle you'll notice that both the knuckle and this control arm here is made of a cast aluminum as opposed to steel furthermore there's only a single ball joint whereas the jeep grand cherokee that i reviewed had a double ball joint with two separate control arms down here so the setup is quite different more like a ram 1500 now you also see that there's fasteners here that are going to control the camber one thing i don't like just like many newer vehicles is that whenever you work in a suspension all the fasteners are considered disposable and you have to replace it. Now looking over here you can see we've got the sway bar where it bolts up to the frame of the vehicle. That's going to go over here to the sway bar link which is going to attach down to the control arm in the axial direction. Furthermore inside of here you can see we've got a bolt on bearing which means that you don't need a press in order to change that out when it wears out. Up at the top here you can see we've got the mandatory dual piston brakes because this is quite a heavy vehicle. Now this is the base model vehicle which means it just has a coilover suspension with just regular coils as opposed to the air suspension which is available on this vehicle. If you did have the Air suspension there would be a compressor and an air tag hidden down there somewhere now moving to the back here we've got the next cross member over here luckily it is easily removable because if you got to do an oil pan gasket on one of these you got to get it out of the way we do have the oil pan here made of stamped steel we've got the oil drain plug here which is perfectly angled so that when it spews out oil it goes all over the sway bar and makes a huge mess now before we get to the transmission you can see the exhaust over here on the driver's side and the other one over here on the passenger side then there's this weird crossover tube over here where the driver goes out to the passenger and then it goes out to the resonator at the back. I guess it just needed to make space for the fuel tank on the left side and that giant resonator over on the right side. Next up we're here at the 8-speed automatic transmission. Here we have an oil pan which is made of plastic. Not really good if you need to go off-road and it cracks. Furthermore look at the drain plug. It's right over the exhaust crossover tube so you can't really access it and even if you could the oil would come spewing out all over that hot exhaust pipe. Pretty stupid design. As a matter of fact the manual just calls for you to loosen off all the pan bolts in order to drain this. In addition the filter itself is integrated into the pan which is a stupid design which means that you're going to need a new pan, filter, fluid, gasket, everything if you want to properly service your transmission. Now, of course once you're done changing that transmission pan there's a fill port located on the side of the transmission here that you keep filling up until it drains all over your hot exhaust. Now if you look up past that stupid drain plug design here you'll see that there's a transmission warmer and what that does is it helps to warm the transmission fluid after you got called in on a Christmas day to work.
Now finally at the tail shaft of the transmission we have the transfer case for the four wheel drive system. Now there's three different four wheel drive system on the Wagoneers but rest assured there is a low transfer case mode which means that you technically could go off roading with this vehicle although it is a pretty heavy and large vehicle to take off road. What it does is it's going to split power between the rear wheels which is what it's biased to through that prop shaft and go to the back and the front wheels which is located through this prop shaft that goes to the front differential. And just above it here you can see the electric motor which is going to do the switching between the four high and four low modes. And of course it too has fluid that needs to be changed with fill and drain plugs located at the back. Now the starter on these, a little difficult to see here, it's actually located against the bell housing just above the front differential. Now replacing the starter on one of these isn't actually too difficult like it seems. There's this heat shield up at the top here and then there's two bolts over at the bell housing side and you should be able to wiggle it out between that prop shaft and that hot catalytic converter waiting to burn your head. Now these little things here mounted to the frame are actually vibration dampeners. They're electronically controlled and vibrate in the opposite frequency of the frame itself so that any noise or harshness actually gets dampened out by this because it's in the opposite direction. Now looking at the back here on the left side you can see the fuel tank. Now there is a regular low pressure fuel pump and filter inside of there and when it burns out you do need to drop the tank in order to change it out. There's no access hole from the top. Luckily it's pretty easy. There's just two straps and it drops right down unlike a Ram 1500 where you got to remove the entire bed. Now with the wheel removed taking a look at the front suspension you can see we have a very simple double wishbone design and this will definitely suit the entitled person who doesn't really take this thing off-road. Now here's one interesting thing. We have a composite upper control arm. You have your typical stamp steel here on the outside, but on the inside here you can see there's plastic which is reinforcing it and that forms a composite between the two. It makes it a lot more rigid, but a lot lighter than just using a forged control arm. Now the ball joint saga here also seems to be plastic, so I'm not sure if that's replaceable. However, I'd probably opt with replacing this with a proper aftermarket control arm when it does fail. I guess plastic starting to make its way more into structural components now and that's the future especially with light weighting although it's not really good for the environment when you got to recycle it here's a look at that cast lower control arm there's a couple of threaded holes here for some features that we probably didn't get on this model and here's another look at that axially loaded sway bar leg these are actually a common problem on the ram 1500s to wear out and cause clunking and of course here we got the inner and the outer tie rod for your toe adjustment and a look back here at those bolts that are going to bolt on the bearing onto this aluminum knuckle i also see a little ball here as well as a tab here with a threaded hole probably for features we didn't get like adaptive dampers or the air suspension system. Taking a look at the brakes from the outside here I think they really cut costs here by only going with a two piston design. They should have upgraded to like a four pot or six pot design. Now you could probably get away with this on a Chevy Equinox but on a big vehicle with a body on frame V8 SUV like this one this really isn't going to cut it and you can kind of feel it when you test drive this vehicle especially considering that these vehicles are going to be literally in the left lane and stop and go traffic on your way up to the cabin on a Friday afternoon. And the same thing goes for the tires here. There's no pretension that this could be an off-road vehicle. It's the same thread pattern that you'd find on the Chevy Cruze. Taking a look at the rear suspension here, you can see it has a multi-link design, which is a lot better for ride quality, this being more of a passenger vehicle, as opposed to the solid axle that the Ram 1500 that this is based on uses. Now at the front here, you can see we've got all four links here. They're all made of aluminum. Now all of these links here connect to an aluminum knuckle, as well as directly to the steel tubular frame on the vehicle. Finally, at the back here, you can see this rear link, which is made of steel, and it's got the coilover suspension on it. Of course, there is an option to have air springs at the back here, which would change things up a little bit. Taking a look at the back brakes here, the diameter is almost the same as the front brakes actually, but we do have a single piston caliper, which I think is a little small. At the back here, you've got an electronic parking brake, which luckily there is a shop mode that you can put in on the screen, and that'll allow you to change the brake pads yourself without a scan tool. Now, interestingly enough, the knuckle itself has a protrusion that connects to this bushing, which is the sway bar link at the bottom there. There's a ball joint, and then that goes to the sway bar, which is connected to the frame. This is like one of the most generic wheel locks ever. There's nothing really to it. Taking a look under the rear of the Wagoneer, you can see that cross frame construction. Once again, there's no arrow or body panels underneath the back here either. So one of the first things I noticed when I popped off the cover for the hitch is that there's no sponge or foam underneath here to protect the bumper from getting cracked. Most vehicles will use a hard foam in between here to absorb some of that impact. Of course, it's nice that Jeep includes a full size spare tire under here, although it's not the same radius or style as the one that's optioned on the vehicle. Now underneath the rear wheel here, there's this giant cavity and it's not covered up by anything like a lot of other SUVs is what seems like a place where a lot of snow and salt would just kick up and stick in here and cause these frames to rust. At least that cavity has a purpose on the passenger side where you have this little tiny muffler at the back. So speaking of the exhaust, here's that giant center muffler and it actually goes up over the frame and then to the rear exhaust pipe. This exhaust looks like it's leaking already. That's not good. And now we'll have a listen to the exhaust. <laughs> Thank you. 
Take a look at the structure here. You can see this is the frame itself. There's no subframe that holds the suspension components. They're all bolted directly to the frame itself. Here's the rear lower control arm that holds the strut. You can see it looks like Swiss cheese because they wanted to save weight. Although salt and snow is probably going to get stuck in here. And there's no drain holes on the bottom so it'll probably rust out soon. I don't like how this brake line is so loose and can easily touch the wheel. They should have probably tied it up somewhere. And here's a look at the rear suspension from underneath. Once again you can see these bearings in the back here are a bolt-on design. So when they do wear out you don't need a press in order to change them out. The knuckle here itself is made of aluminum to save weight. So here we've got the rear CV axle. You can see it's a nice chunky size over here, especially this being a rear wheel drive based V8 vehicle. You're definitely going to want to have a nice beefy axle so you can show off burnouts to your kids in the mall parking lot while you're stuck in there on a Black Friday. Now powering that rear axle is this giant differential. It also is an electronically locking differential. You can see the motor up there. Here's your fill and drain ports that you'll have to change for the fluid. They've actually put in this grab handle here so when you drop the tank you have something to hook onto. And now let's have a listen to the engine. And that's a wrap on the mechanicals of the Jeep Wagoneer. As you can see, under the hood things are pretty simple, easily laid out, and very easy to work on. So mechanically, I think this is a pretty good setup. However, underneath the vehicle, I think that's where we could improve on, especially things like the transmission filter and the starter placement is a little difficult to get to. Now, while this engine might be fairly reliable, it's been out for a long time, it is antiquated and slated to be replaced by the inline six cylinder, which is gonna be a whole other complexity of its own, especially with turbochargers and intercoolers and more electronics controlling that all that's going to be a lot more complicated overall i think jeep is just trying to cash in on that higher end family and fisherman market who want to make a statement with a seven slot grill and when it comes down to the bottom line they're just recycling the ram 1500 frame and engine so they're really just milking it as far as they can go because to be honest most buyers are not going to be buying it based on the mechanicals of this vehicle but based on the push buttons and touch screens inside now you tell me in the comment section down below what do you think of the jeep wagoneer is this in a dying breed of old school SUVs or is this what it takes to make a fashion statement in 2023. Now make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.